Hello. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. We are Club 17. That's the 17th club out of 46,000 Rotary Clubs worldwide. Our motto is service above self, and we are proudly in our second century of service to Cincinnati. Last week, Doug Bolton reminded us that since we're in that second century of service, we should all pull out the phones and check in on Facebook at the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. I think I learned how to do that just last week, so. But it is going to help promote our wonderful club. It's a great day to be a Cincinnatian. FC Cincinnati won last, last night, undefeated at home on top of MLS. In addition, our beloved Cincinnati Reds swept the Colorado Rockies, 11 straight wins. Was that like the first time since like 1957 or something like that? Well, it's a great day to celebrate Cincinnati and we have a award-winning Cincinnati to celebrate with us today. We're delighted to welcome C.F. Payne or Chris Payne, award-winning illustrator and author of Cincinnati Characters, The Unknown unappreciated and unhinged. That's a very interesting title. We're, we're sorry, Chris, that your co-author Brent Coleman couldn't be here today. He kind of fell ill yesterday, but... So Brent is the author, you're the illustrator, Chris. Well, again, we, we wish him a speedy recovery and we're delighted that you were able to you know, stand in uh, his shoes and yours. Look forward to your comments and presentations about this interesting new book about local Cincinnati characters. Uh, I'd say let's begin our meeting with the National Anthem. We have Bill Stilley and Kay Atkins leading it, followed by the four-way test and invocation by Michael Villardo. Won't you pray with me? God in whom we live and move and have our being, we pause for these moments to center ourselves and to give thanks for the day and the gift of this day. It is the day not yet fully formed and we all of us are co-creators of what it can become. We pray that our thoughts, our actions, and interactions will promote truth, fairness, goodwill, and be beneficent to all around us. What we do will be that of which historians will one day write. We pray that they will write stories that reflect the values of which we speak. We're grateful for our speaker today and his willingness to share with us his talents and developed skills and the stories of the history of this region. We look forward to hearing how these form from the past and have shaped who we are today. We're also grateful for our President Stephen King for his leadership over this last year. And we look forward to next week's transition. There are those among us with needs, 
feeling the loss of loved ones, an illness, or a concern, hold them in the palm of your hand. We pray these prayers in all the holy names of God. Amen. Amen. Now join with me in the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? We don't look forward because you're gone. We just look forward to it. <laughs> but we ask, we ask you to remain standing for a moment of remembrance and memorial. Thank you for this opportunity to share my memories. I'm sorry, I don't know why, but I feel really teary about doing this today, but in a minute I'll be fine. And give this tribute to my dear friend, Charlie Ratherman. In 2001, when I joined the club, Charlie had already been a member of our club for 29 years. At its passing that last fall, he had been an active Cincinnati club, club Rotarian for 50 years, a half century. To me and to everyone he met, he was welcoming, poised, <coughs> and the consummate gentleman he had a lively sense of humor, creative mind, and was always coming up with strategies to strengthen Rotary. During COVID, his failing health made attending Rotary meetings too taxing, yet he wanted very much to host some Zoom Rotary meetings at his beautiful apartment at the Kenwood. But I'll tell you what, he never figured out how to do the Zoom. <laughs> so even if we had come, it would have been a disaster trying to get to the meetings. So we never quite managed to do this, but connecting with Rotary was in his mind, even in his last days. In his career, he had served as president of the Bodie Finn Company, a material handling equipment distributor, and ultimately grew the company to seven branches with 350 employees. He took much pride in his accomplishments in business, investing, and the time he served in the military. He shared vivid memories of his military service as second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Signal Corps. And I'll tell you, he could tell wonderful stories. Um, they were vivid and true, and even though they took place decades earlier, um, they were top of mind for him any time you asked about his service. Uh, several years ago, he was invited to take a special honor flight with other veterans to tour the veteran memorials in Washington, D.C. Um, and um, Henry Heimlich also made such a trip. And for both of these men, these Rotarians, it was such an honor um, for them to be taken in these private jets to see those memorials that meant so much to them. This was a great honor and a memory he treasured. Charlie was quite the romantic and described how thrilled he was when Mabel, the lovely and brilliant woman who stole his heart, agreed to marry him. He gave her credit for much of his success relied on her, and missed her deeply when she was gone. And they were a pair. Um, they liked to have their four o'clock cocktails, and Mabel was doing that even when she had cancer. You know, it was like, hey, honey, it's four o'clock. It's time. I used to tease him about what a traditional husband he had been. He thought it was quite appropriate that he was ignorant of even the simplest food preparation. And he finally did actually learn how to use a microwave and a coffee pot. But um, I think he felt, as the man of the house, knowing how to open a bottle of wine was quite sufficient. 
and he was fine with that. When he moved from his home, um, they had shared in Finneytown to the Kenwood. Um, this meant he could count on three meals a day. So uh, that was a great improvement in his life. And actually, I, I found that he was quite lonely when he was living in the house without Mabel. And moving into this retirement community was good for his health and good for his, um, his sense of himself. And being able to put on a suit each evening and go down to dinner, I think, made him feel like himself. He was an active member of the St. Bartholomew Catholic Church and practiced the six core Jesuit values, including women and men for others. He adored his accomplished and successful children, Tom and Susan, who are with us today. He marveled that his daughter Susan, as a young professional, was elected to become the youngest president of Rotary Chicago Club number one, and a woman at that. Her connection to Rotary was part of his legacy, and he was so proud of you. He was generous with his resources as well as his wisdom, and was loved by members of both Cincinnati and Covington Rotary Club. A few years ago, he hosted a lovely after-hours event at the elegant party room on the top floor of the Kenwood. Until his health made attendance difficult, Charlie was a constant presence at meetings and Rotary events. For a lifetime of commitment to Rotary in 2016, he became the 23rd member to receive our club's esteemed Wally Emerling Award. Then in 2020, the Covington Rotary Club selected Charlie to receive their highest Ken Harper Award which he accepted at their centennial celebrations. He had been a valued member, donor, and leader for several years in their club, and they were so pleased that he was able to accept the award in person. Ariel Miller, Melinda Kelly, and I were there to witness his humility and happiness in his acceptance speech. Along with being a Paul Harris Fellow, one of the last awards Charlie received was a major donor award presented to him in 2021 at his home at the Kenwood. The club president, Brett Labar, district governor, Bill Shula, and I all attended. Having multiple visitors during COVID was a special event, and he actually had to get permission for it, to have like three people visit. Um, and this gesture, the gesture of our presence there and giving him that award um, made him truly happy. During the last several years, I often dropped by for a visit, um, chatted on the phone, or brought ingredients so we could share a home-cooked meal. I occasionally came to the Friday night social hour at the Kenwood, where over cocktails, Charlie chatted with male residents and charmed the women. He was not shy about dancing with them, and even as he aged, remained quite dashing. His stories of his travels, accomplishments, and updates on the family were always entertaining. This is how I'll remember him. He and Mabel at Rotary picnics and other Rotary events. His taking time each year to orient international graduate students to life in the United States having visits with him and his friends at the Kenwood, his kindness and friendship to me and to others, his love of history, art, and beautiful surroundings in his home and in nature, how much he loved life, traveling the world, spending time with family, and being a lifetime member of Rotary, his cheerfulness, optimism, intelligence, and bravery, even till the very end. I imagine that our spirits live on, and we take the form when we pass as our healthiest, happiest, best selves. So today, 
May Charlie and Mabel be lovers in their 30s, or young parents with their adorable children, or still traveling the world together, discovering the beauty and wonders that gave them such joy. May fe they feel the warmth of laughing, playing, and being together, and the loneliness of being separated these many years, only a distant memory. May they feel content with the honorable lives they lived and live on in our hearts and memories. Rest in peace, dear Rotarian. Charlie Radham. Where's your bell? You may be seated. Thank you, Janet. Ratterman family, on behalf of the club, we wanted to present you with Charlie Ratterman's badge. This badge looks like he wore it for 50 years. In honor of Charlie Ratterman, Cincinnati Rotarian since 1972, service above self. We're really going to miss him. Moving to welcome our guests and prospective members, Nancy Reese. Thank you, President Steve. It's always an honor and a pleasure to invite so many of you that have come as prospective members and also our guests. So when I announce your name, if you would please stand up so we can give you a warm Rotarian welcome, I'd appreciate it. Our first person is Richard Benson, and um, he is retired from working at the Enquirer, so he came to hear our speaker, and he is a guest of Jim Crowley. Jim? <laughs> Next we have Tim Hecker, and he is the, wi he is the wife. Um, he is the husband of Angie Hawk, who is a member. So welcome. <laughs> Sorry about that, Tim. And we're glad you're here. Next we have Craig Cotty who is Ronald McDonald House, and Craig is a guest of Michael Schatzman. Welcome, Craig. <laughs> Next, we have Ryan Opichka. He is with NFP, which is a brokerage firm, and he is a guest here with Tim Mikaji. <laughs> and then we have Don Dickman, who's here with his wonderful wife, Barbara. Don, where are you? There you are. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, and last but definitely not least, we have Stephanie Katchman, who is Don's wife. Welcome, Stephanie. Where'd she go? There she is. Thank you all. I'm sorry. I bet you this is Roger Cruz. Okay. So, Roger Cruz is with Go Metro, and he is also a guest of Michael Schatzman. Welcome. <laughs> Roger. Thank you, Nancy Reese. Guests, we hope you enjoy the meeting today and come back and join us in service. We now have a special announcement, and it's a surprise. I'd like to welcome Jennifer Loeb to the podium. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jen Loeb. I've met many of you before. I'm the CEO at Ronald McDonald House, and uh, we have a little surprise today, and Al is like, what's going on? Because Al probably knows maybe it's about him now that he sees his daughter next to me. Um, <laughs> so let me just tell, first I want to thank Christy and Sarah for allowing me to come today on short notice and um, give me just a couple minutes at the podium. But we have a fun surprise, and we wanted to share it with all of you, because you are some of Al's dearest friends. Um, Al, as many of you know, is a longtime board member at Ronald McDonald House. I've been there 25 years. Al's been there more than 30 because he helped hire me. And I mean, who does that? Who gives 30 years of their life to something they believe about 
uh, believe in so passionately. Um, Al has been our board treasurer, our board chair, our expansion and building committee chair. He has um, raised money for the capital campaign. He's introduced hundreds of people to the house over the years. Um, he's done pretty much everything you can imagine to help our charity succeed and to thrive. Um, back in 2008, we honored Al and his late wife, Janice, um, with our House Advocate Award. Janice, I want to note too, started our gala in this very building um, probably 20 years ago. Our first gala was at the Phoenix, and Janice was instrumental to that. His daughter Pamela has been involved um, with our Young Professionals group, and it's really been a, a family love for Ronald McDonald House. So while we're here today, is um, we have at our gala a very special award called the Heart Award, and it is for our most passionate and dedicated advocates who um, have committed their lives to caring for the kids at Ronald McDonald House and who make our our house and our community and our world a better place. And so this year at our gala, which is September 30th, we want to honor Al Conscious with the Heart Award. We have a special cake. This is Sarah Jordan from our team. We have a cake that says that you're the heart of RMH. And of, of course, we had to bring you a good bottle of wine because we'd be in trouble if we didn't do that. And um, um, I want to invite Pamela, his daughter, just to say a couple words, and then we'll let you get on with your meeting. I just wanted to say I've spent my whole life watching both of my parents dedicating so much of their time to serving others, and it's motivated me to want to follow in their footsteps, and especially seeing his passion and dedication for the Ronald McDonald House has just been incredibly inspiring, and I'm very proud to be here today, so thank you for inviting me here, and um, congratulations on this well-deserved award. Congratulations, Al. Wow, well-deserved. I wish I had a pithy joke. <laughs> well, now we are delighted to, to welcome two new members. For the first of the two new member introductions, I would like to invite Josh Ruth and Steve Mullinger. Josh and Steve, come on down. Steve, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce Steve Mullinger today. Steve Mullinger is the regional president for Southern Ohio, Kentucky region for Huntington Bank. Um, the Huntington National Bank and its affiliates provide full service commercial and consumer banking services, mortgage banking services, automobile financing, uh, a number of other general banking services. Uh, Steve is our local market president. Prior to joining the Huntington National Bank, Steve was the senior vice president and commercial market manager in Greater Cincinnati for U.S. Bank. Responsible for... <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Different color tie. <laughs> Bit of an upgrade. He's a graduate of the University of Cincinnati, holding both a BBA in accounting and MBA in finance. Upon graduation, Steve began his career as an analyst at American Financial Group. He went on to hold the assistant treasurer role at General Cable and was the vice president of mergers and acquisitions at Omnicare. Steve is committed to serving his community as a member of the board of directors of the Cincinnati Regional Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Not really and a number of other various community organizations. 
Uh, personally, Steve and his wife are proud parents of their six children and of their five grandchildren. And please join me in welcoming Steve to Rotary. And now I'd like to invite Ron Dumas up. You might recognize Ron. It's a new member. It wasn't that long ago he was up on this stage. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend Ron Dumas. Ron was born and raised in Cincinnati, attended Woodward High School and Prairie View A&M University in Prairie View, Texas. After a long and distinguished career, Ron retired from the Hamilton County Juvenile Courts, where he'd served as chief constable and other leadership capacities. In 1995, Ron saw a need to help the youth of Jamaica and started a program that would eventually become Reaching Out for Kids. In 97, Reaching Out for Kids was launched in Cincinnati. Reaching Out for Kids uses golf as a platform to teach life lessons, much more important than any sport. It helps to direct the young lives of those that need it the most. In addition to building golf skills, ROFK focuses on character, integrity, education, and life-enhancing values to help increase their potential for successful lifestyles. Over the years, Ron and ROFK have facilitated hundreds of scholarships to colleges and universities throughout the country and Jamaica. Ron's philanthropy has not gone unnoticed. He was awarded the 2022 NAACP President's Award, and in 2018, he was inducted into the African American Golfers Hall of Fame. This March, Ron Dumas and Reaching Out for Kids was the winner of the 2023 Jefferson Awards for Outstanding Public Service. Let's give a warm Rotary welcome to Ron Dumas. Wow, buddy. few announcements. Today's meeting is sponsored by past President Bill Heinrich. Bill's schedule pulled him away today, but he asked me to share that he's proud to sponsor the meeting, but that as a retired guy, I have no business and I have no giveaways. <laughs> <laughs> but he wishes us all a great meeting. <laughs> Birthdays. Wish a happy birthday to the following members this week. Allison Kaufman on the 21st, Tammy Young on the 22nd, Susan Snodgrass on the 26th, and Jim Brooks on the 26th. Happy birthday, everyone. <laughs> Two pieces of sad family of Rotary news. The office learned that longtime Rotarian Joe Hyman passed away quietly back in December on the 19th. He had rectal cancer, but was a very private person and did not want an obituary. Please keep Angie and the entire Hyman family in your thoughts and prayers. And as most of you have learned, our dear friend and Rotarian Hans Popka passed away suddenly yesterday after hip surgery on Tuesday. Keep his wife of 60 years, Uta Popka, in your thoughts and prayers. The family will have a small private service and they have asked that in lieu of flowers and gifts, donations be made to the World Affairs Committee. We have split the pot. I think we have a couple of, okay, we've got two here. First we'll do split the pot, the blue tickets. Blue tickets, let's see, Chris? All right, last three digits are three, two, five. Winner receives $43. Uh, all right, Johnny.
<laughs> so, John, you, you had a shot at $330. <laughs> so, the second pot was the, uh, was the program committee. Molly Rydell and Owen Raspin, the program committee, they pulled together this basket with wine and Yetis, and we appreciate this effort to raise money on behalf of all the committees who appreciate this budget. And the winner, winning ticket is 190. All right, Bob. So there's a save the date for the next happy hour on July 5th, 4.30 to 6.30 at Cooper and Flame. Look for those details in DACDB, save the date July 5th. All right. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Jim Nyhard for, to introduce our program. Thank you, President Steve. Um, we're, we're tight on time, so the last thing you need to hear is a bunch of Michigas from me. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce CF Chris Payne. I'm going to work from the premise there or the presumption that everybody read the bios and the e-rays, and you, you really know the, the, the gravitas of our guest Chris Payne, uh, illustrator, uh, member of the Illustration Hall of Fame, illustrations in the New York Times, uh, Mad Magazine, point of clarification, he did not create Alfred E. Newman. Uh, uh, Time Magazine, you name it, uh, he has illustrated it. Uh, it's just a, a, a true Cincinnatian for which I am uh, very proud to introduce, uh, to talk about the book that he and uh, Brent Coleman, who uh, wrote all the vignettes of these Cincinnatians. So without any further ado, I give you Chris Payne. Um, hi, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm not sure whether we're on a tight schedule, so I'll try to uh, make this somewhat informative and brief. Unfortunately, uh, Brent uh, Coleman, the author of the book, is not able to be here. Um, he has had some health issues that uh, has caused some problems for him, and not being able to attend this is just one of them. Uh, one thing I'll make a note of, uh, we, I did bring some books. If you do want a book, yeah, Brent will be happy to, for me to collect $40 per book from anybody who wants it. I'll be glad to stick around, sign it for you. Uh, but I'm, it, we're here to talk about the book. and. For those of you who grew up here in Cincinnati and have lived here in Cincinnati for a long, long time, I think most of us all have a great deal of pride in the history of Cincinnati. Uh, Brent is, is not originally from Cincinnati, he's from uh, Southern California. And he came here uh, 35 years ago and started working at the uh, Cincinnati Enquirer. And back there, I think you, you worked with uh, Brent for a number of years. And so I'm sure you have a number of good Brent stories, but uh, one of the things that Brent uh, Brent was live is living over in Price Hill and lived over there for a long period of time. And in his capacity and the work that he was doing with the uh, Enquirer, after a while he started thinking, you know, w w Price Hill, where did that name come from? Where did that where does that come from? And eventually he he did his research, and and found found out Reese Reese Price. Uh, he also st was doing a lot of work on basically home houses, well, historic houses, and that also coupled in with his interest of uh, Cincinnati history. And one of the projects somebody asked him about was, you know, to write an article on basically on one of those stories of which he completed one. And they said, well, can you do another? Well, he ended up doing 50, 50 of them. And somewhere along the lines, he thought, this, this could potentially be a nice book. So what he ended up doing was he whittled it down to 30. Of which, by the way, if you want to hear Brent, hear Brent tell that story, you can. All you have to do is go on your computer, go on WVXU. And he and I did a radio show. And it was, I think, 
yesterday or the day before at noon. So you could actually go to WVXU's archives and listen to that. It would, it, it's a program, as I say, it ran at noon at 8 o'clock. You'll see the title of Cincinnati Characters, and if you want to listen to that, you can. So I'm here to basically talk about the, the book and the process that we went through to get this book created. Now, I met Brett, Brent, basically in a very kind of serendipitous way. Um, I've, I've got a friend of mine who is in, you know, does house building, restorations, things of that nature, and he was working on a house just down the street from here, and a uh, historic house, and he wanted me to paint kind of this, in the entryway, this mural. And so I did, was did working on that, and lo and behold, Brent comes in to see this, and that's how I met him, because Brent was interested in the historic work that Andy was doing on this house and the mural I was doing. So that's basically how we met. And the guy that was doing the construction was a guy I went to high school with. So it's just all very kind of serendipitous way it, it all happened. So um, Brent came up with the title, uh, Cincinnati Characters Unknown, Unappreciated, Unhinged. And one of the, p the points was, was the fact that now here is, I started getting texts from him, all these sheets and sheets, and on the left hand side, all the names of the various people that we were going to be doing the illustrations of. And again, he was, he was taking famous Cincinnatians, but not, you know, the, the mega ones that we all know about, Roy Rogers and, and William Howard Taft and folks like that. He was taking names, for example, like I said, Price, where does that come from? Fort Mitchell. Okay, who's, who's Mitchell? Who's Fort Thomas? Who, who's that? And other names uh, such as that. And that's where he was beginning to pull them. And then he was also looking for unique and interesting characters. And so one of them, you know, let me, I got to use the book as a bit of a cheat sheet here because it, it helps me. Um, you know, for example, uh, it, is it James Duncanson? You know, um, he was a painter, African American painter in the mid part of the 1800s. And it was interesting, my wife and I just not that long ago came back from a road trip where we went to Crystal Bridges. Have any of you guys been to Crystal Bridges, the museum there? James Duncanson's paintings are, are there at the museum. So uh, it, it was fun going up to a painting going, I know that dude, I know that dude. So, but it was through this book. It was through this book. So I got basically the titles of, of the, or the stories about the artists. And so then I had to do research. Okay, because Brent didn't, Brent specifically wanted this to be an art book because he knew that oftentimes with historic books, finding quality reference for everybody is very limited. So sometimes you'll get a beautiful photograph of somebody that's quite wonderful. Another one would be terribly out of focus, not a very good image. And so the consistency of how the book is presented is limited by the quality of the pictures you can get. Whereas he came to me, asked me about doing this book, and we could then maintain the standards of, in the illustrations. Now I've been working for a number of years as an illustrator doing this kind of stuff. You know, some children's books, pictures like this. Um, but over the years, I had been working on some other publishing, and I came up with a technique in doing this uh, version of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, where the, the publisher wanted a number of images. And the amount of time that it would take to do the stuff that you saw before would have been just over, over taxing. You just couldn't do it. So I came up with a style that really, I felt, had a journalistic feel to it more, you know, it was quicker, but it was, you, you had the deckled edge that was raw, and through that particular technique, you use these various, just, that's all the supplies you really need, is you need a brayer, a couple tubes of paint, some colored pencils, and your sketchbook. And I do these workshops, and this, these are some of the images that I showed Brent prior to doing the book. I said, this is sort of how I want to do this. These are just sketches out of my sketchbook, is scenes from you know movie stills and portraits of different folks and he said yeah okay and this is the process you start with a drawing you roll the paint on with a brayer 
and then you use colored pencils and paint to finish it off. So he agreed, he said, let me see how you do it. So I took and did two or three initial pieces for him to see what it would look like. So there is Reese Price and again, Sariyami, boy, how do you pronounce that one there? That's a mouthful. Glad he didn't play basketball and have to put that on the back of his basketball jersey. <laughs> I mean, but uh, anyway, so I did that particular portrait and he felt pretty confident about it. So did Nellie Taft, John Yuri Lloyd. The thing though was, again, like I said, finding reference for some of the people was very, very easy, but some folks, it was very, very different, difficult. Eliza Potter, there weren't any existing photographs of her. Now she was a hairstylist here in the middle part of the 1800s. She created this book, kind of tell-all book of about Cincinnatians of the work she did, you know, kind of the gossip she heard in the hairstyling shop she worked. So basically what I was able to do, go through the history and find photographs of African-American women from that time period and find some that could piece together and come up with a whole new character. Julius Potter was, uh, Jack Dexter rather, Julius Dexter, all I could find was just a really, not a very good drawing of him. I could see he wore the little pinched glasses, he had the mustache, but I knew of his gravesite over there at Spring Grove and so I utilized the, the, the form of the gravesite and put his features onto the gravesite to come up with a creative outlet, you know, expression of that. Interestingly enough, that Stephen Gerard, he was known as the Cantaloupe King. And, <laughs> and the thing was, though, I mean, he, he was around living until like the, like the 1930s, of which, you know, plenty of cameras, there should have been some images. But I mean, try and try and try. I could not find a single image, not even a drawing that gave me a sense of what the man looked like. So you got nothing to work with there. <laughs> so you get a little surreal, stick a cantaloupe on the collar and give him a crown and you, you now have a cantaloupe king. The other thing too you had with not just that was you had some images that of his stories on the founders of Cincinnati of which he featured five individuals and how was I to fit five people into a composition and so I just used the profiles and all again these are people from the 17 and early part of the 1800s basically working from drawings and trying to kind of work through that. The generals that's Fort Mitchell, Fort Thomas and what was the third fort anyway the Fort, eh, not Fort Washington but anyway but you found those they were all three Civil War generals and so we piece them together into that composition. So that's essentially the process in which the book was created. Now, some of the more unique stories, if, if, you're, if you want to know, and I'm not going to give away all of them, but I'm telling you, you really, the coolest one, well, there were a number of them, but uh, the one that, that I get such a kick out of is, oh, hang on, what's her name? Libby Holman. Anybody know that name, Libby Holman? I mean, you gotta read this story. I mean, she was uh, from Cincinnati. She wanted to get into theater and, and show business and she did that. And then she uh, was well known for, you know, the circle she ran in. She married, I think, the, one of the heirs of the Reynolds, you know, tobacco company, and then was accused of murdering him. Uh, you know, there's, there's been at least two movies in Hollywood that have been loosely based on her life and her story. Later on, she was kind of a mentor to people like Montgomery Clift in acting. And just, I'm not going to tell you how she moved to the other side, but it's, it's a very unique story. It's just, it's an amazing thing. So, so again, you have people here in the book that are very accomplished and leaders in their professions. You have other people that are more infamous in their lives. And it's a very unique uh, combination of stories of different people that, again, who are not on the Mount Rushmore of Cincinnati history, 
but their lives are right there. We know so much because streets are named after them, buildings are named after them, communities are named after them, and they've just had very, very interesting lives. And so that was the idea behind the book. I, I wish Brent was here because he could tell you from his perspective how he came about to all these folks. But again, if you listen to the WVXU uh, program, you should be able to see something. So with that, um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. I hope you have. I hope that gives you a little insight to, to how the book was produced. Um, if, if you have any questions. Yes. Well, you know, it's funny. I always try to think of my, my favorite illustration is going to be the next one. Um, but <laughs> I think, you know, you have to, you know, from the history, the one I guess I'm really proud of, I did the uh, cover uh, for Time Magazine for when Barack Obama was uh, inaugurated. The interesting thing is, uh, I'll try to make this story short. It was originally, I was originally commissioned. Time Magazine, the way Time Magazine works, and you in editorial publishing, you know this, the deadlines are incredibly tight. Time Magazine's a weekly magazine. Most of the time, Time Magazine would call me on a Wednesday, and the art would have to be in New York on Friday. And this is before electronically sending. Back in the day, I'd work on it till about 4 o'clock in the morning on Thursday, drive down to Cincinnati Airport, put it on Delta Dash. They'd fly it to New York. Somebody would pick it up, drive it into Manhattan. So that's kind of the way it is, always is. Now, they called me to do this Barack Obama portrait for, at that time, you know, Time Magazine's Person of the Year. Now, when you really think about it, Barack Obama is elected first African-American President of the United States in November. That's November early, November. Now, who's going to be Person of the Year for Time Magazine that year? What? Who? I mean, what's it going to be? You know, it's going to be Lou Pinella? No, it's going to be Barack Obama. We know that. <laughs> But when does Time Magazine call me? Late December, on a Thursday, can you have this to us by Monday? And they sent me some pictures, and I said, okay, and they specifically asked me to do it in a certain style, because they didn't want it to be a caricature for person of the year. They wanted it to be in the tradition of Time Magazine covers at that time. So I said, okay, and I got the reference. I asked them again, because you're working with a contemporary photograph, be sure you get permission from the photographer and negotiate a fee for the photographer to be paid for us to use his image or her image, which they did. I did the art, sent it in, and then waited to see if it was going to be on the cover for Person of the Year. In the end, they chose the Shepherd Fairy piece, the famous, the artist who did the red, white, and blue Hope poster. And when my wife found out they chose Shepherd Fairy, I will not say what she said. <laughs> it was only two words. And uh, anyway, so, and I, I even told Tom, the art director of Time Magazine that story, you know, told him the whole story. But, you know, so there it went. But fortunately, about a week, ten days later, it said they were so thrilled with the job I did on that piece, and they were so proud of it, they wanted to use it for the inaugural cover. So that's, that's basically how that went. So there's a, hence, there's a sense of history, there's a fun story behind it. But I mean, you know, for me as an illustrator, being able, you know, I worshipped Mad Magazine as a kid. Being, being able to do, you know, seven or eight covers for Mad Magazine was a thrill. Being able to do some artwork for postage stamps, that was a thrill. So I've been very, very blessed in doing this. And, having Brent include me on this, where he allowed me to, because most of the time the illustrators are always asked, you know, we will, you know, I want to do it this way. And most art directors are saying, no, we want you to do it this way. They're always having your past dictate what you do. We like that. We like that. And illustrators, artists of all kinds, it doesn't matter whether you're a writer, a musician, or whatever it is, you're trying to move it forward 
You don't want your past to dictate your creativity for your future. And so Brent gave me the opportunity to use this process that I've been playing with for some time to be able to create this book, and I'm really proud of the final product. Yes? So, so with all the tools that are available, visual and otherwise, do you wish you were you know, kind of in your formative uh, career today, or are you happy with where you were born and when you were born? <laughs> well, you know, to be honest with you, if you really wanted to, you know, do I, would I prefer, am I glad I'm not dead yet? Yeah, I mean, that helps. <laughs> but, but, but to go to your point, it's not so much the tools, you have to understand, back in the days of, you know, the Charles Dana Gibsons and those folks, you know, their art was for magazines and publishing, and that was the high end, because they weren't competing with movies, they weren't competing with TV game, TV shows, they weren't competing with video games. So, you know, Charles Dana Gibson in 1904 was commissioned by Collier's Magazine to do 50 drawings, pen and ink drawings, for two years, 50 at one year, 50 the next year. And he was paid $1,000 a drawing in 1904. And that was just one client. Maxfield Parrish, when he created the Garden of Allah print that they made prints of and sold them, he was one of the first artists to work out a royalty deal for his artwork. And in like 1928, that, that piece of art, I think, he made like $90,000 that year off that one piece of art in like 1928. So uh, illustrators nowadays, if you get a commission to do it for a publication, you know, you're lucky to get 750, 1500, 2500, something like that for an illustration. But back in those days, those guys were like rock stars. I mean, James Montgomery Flagg was hanging out with Douglas Fairbanks and partying with those dudes. It's just a different world. But you know what? I'm, when I was a kid drawing pictures, that's what I like to do. And so I'm, I've had the opportunity to draw pictures and make a living for my family uh, for 45 years. So I don't care. I, I like what I'm doing. Yes? The artwork in the uh, Playhouse in the Park is yours. How did that come about? Um, Peter Robinson was one of the uh, assistant director associates at the publication, apparently found out about my work, contacted me. I went and met with him and Ed Stern and talked about the, the prospects of doing it. And then it was really, again, I'm doing artwork for publishing. Most of the art's like that big. This stuff was that big. So we had to really kind of plot out how this was going to work. And so it took a fair amount of research on my part to figure out how we were going to do it. And it was going to be done on canvas. Then we had to find where am I going to get the canvas that's going to be big enough for this and how are we gonna do this? So we had to do it in pieces, and then what you do is you just don't throw it up and start painting, you have to do the initial drawing. So how do I get that and then project that to transfer it to that? So we had to figure a lot of that stuff out, but it was really just uh, the, uh, the idea of Peter Robinson's at the uh, Cincinnati Playhouse that uh, was the generation of that. But, and just to let you know, for that thing, I was, you know, you just don't work on it. So what I would do, it was like for almost nine months, I would go down to the playhouse where they create their sets and they set up a side there. And I would go there and get down there at like eight o'clock in the morning, paint till noon, and then go home and work in my studio on other stuff. And I was also teaching at Columbus College of Art and Design at the time, and where I still, and now I'm the director of the MFA program at the Hartford Art School. So yeah, yes sir. So I invited Peter Robinson to be with us today. Ah, doggone. He'd be, well, he, would, he could tell you even more. I'm sure, and I know he will. Uh, he said to say hello. He Thank you. He's in Maine yeah. week, Oh, he's up in Maine right now. Here. Yeah. Uh, he said to say hi. Well, I saw him in Middletown. He came down to Middletown when I had, or up to Middletown when I had the show up there. So, yeah, thank you. Please say hi to him. Yes, sir. Hey. Uh, comment or question. Uh, first, uh, 15, 18 years ago, uh, Seattle did a, uh, some portraits for the Reds Community Fund. We raised hundreds of thousands of dollars throughout the community with that, which I uh, thank you. Uh, second of all, as far as the book, um, uh, Brent picked the subjects solely. I mean, are you any input on that, or he was, he said there's 30? 30, 
30 Cincinnatians, yeah, no, Brent picked him out of the stories that he had. And he, he, as I said, he picked him out for a wide range of areas, not just so it's, it, there was a level of uh, diversity issues that he wanted to have, not just in DNA, but I mean diversity in what they did, who they were, things of that nature, points of interest, some were uplifting, some were, like I said, unhinged, you know. <laughs> you get stuck with the cantaloupe king and not having a picture, that's too bad, you gotta come up with something. Yeah, and, and, but that, it worked out good. I'm just glad he wasn't like the shrimp king or something like that. <laughs> I mean, cantaloupe worked out good. The cantaloupe, that worked out fine. But it was nice that he had a couple baseball people in here, Charlie Gould, you know, and folks like that. So I got a little bit of my baseball in there too. Any other questions? But I thank you very, yes, sir. Um, your artwork's beautiful and amazing. Can you talk a little bit about the process that you were utilizing to create it to speed up your production? Yeah, I mean, basically my technique is, again, because of the fact illustration is so much controlled by deadlines. People often ask me, what's the difference between illustration and fine art? And I always say, well, illustration is art done under the circumstances. Because you have deadlines, all these other th things that come into play. But the process that, I, that I'm using is as is, is old as Titian. It's just, I just use different materials. I mean, Titian would get down to drawing it so much, and then he'd start blending in, getting values put in, and washes in it, but it was all oils, all that. So I start off with my thing and I get a drawing. It's, it's all dictated by the initial drawing, getting all my questions answered in the drawing. And then you, once you get that drawing and it's transferred onto your board or whatever service you're working on, then you want to put what we call a, what we call a middle value. Middle value means if zero is white, 100% is black, 50% is gray in the middle, where you get a, like a 50% of a brown or a 40% of a brown whatever color you want to put down. So that puts that middle value down. So now once you get that established, then you can start pushing in your darks, your dark tones, right? To start getting your shadows. Shadows tell, give you form, color gives you light. So once you start getting the shadows in, now you're establishing form and now you can start pulling out color and light with either colored pencils, acrylics, gouache, whichever mediums you want to work in. So that's primarily it. Um, using this particular technique, and these are all done in my sketchbooks, it's just, it's just a fun way. I, I sort of semi-discovered this process with rolling, getting my middle value to put down with, with, with some acrylics and ultra matte medium that you roll down, you get that nice middle tone value that you want, but when you roll it down, it creates a texture onto the paper that really accepts the pigments that you want very, very nicely, and it works great, and I just like as I said, it has a deckled edge to it that gives it kind of a journalistic feel to it, kind of a spontaneity, rather than looking terribly formal. There's a spontaneity. That's what I really appreciated about it. And yes, sir. How did you become associated with Mad Magazine? Well, again, you, what happens in the world of publishing is you, you do artwork. I mean, I started working for, like, say, when I was in Dallas, the Dallas Times Herald or something like that and people start to see your work, you send your art out to art directors trying to fish for more jobs. And when I started getting work for magazines like Rolling Stone and Esquire and Sports Illustrated, eventually Mad Magazine, they saw that work there and uh, you know the uh, art directors apparently liked my work there and that's how they uh, contacted me. It's, it's that type of thing. That's one of the things about publishing. You, that sadly is kind of going away, but it's, it makes it tougher because people would see your artwork on a magazine. Yes? So I'm with the Cincinnati Tech and Print Museum. As you're talking about in your early career, are you actually making letterpress plates for some of your illustrations? No. <laughs> no. But no, somebody, no. somebody must have taken your illustration and made those printing plates so they could be mass, your images could be mass produced. Well, I mean, mine is four-color process, so they have to create their, you know, four-color separations. You know, I mean, you, 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 you got to go back to the Charles Dana Gibson days of where, I mean, those guys, they would do a pen and ink drawing, well, even go farther back to like Winslow Homer, they would, he would do a pen and ink drawing, and they would send it to the printer where they had engravers, and they would do an engraved co copy of the drawing. 
And, and so, and then it wasn't until like the 1870s that the photo process came where then they could make the photocopy of the drawing, which allowed artists to be more detailed and delineated with their work. And so when they were doing the yellow and the cyan, they were actually using black ink, weren't they? And then in their minds, they would know what that 50% of this black would do for the yellow and the red to create that color when it was actually printed. Well, I, I think that to some, and I think what they ended up doing a lot of times, you know, because you really didn't get into, you know, the uh, the dot patterns until later on. So that, yeah, you're getting into the, into the weeds of history, going all the way back to the magazines like Punch, and I'm not that old. <laughs> Pretty sure you're Mad Magazine was printed by Leather Press Process. Well, Mad Magazine, of course. I mean, that was what 1956, and that was Harvey Kurtzman, and and uh, yeah, and those guys, you know. The Mad Magazine is a great story into itself, but you guys got to get home and Let's we got to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that again. Yeah, tell them what and like I said, I got copies of the book over there. I'll sit out there if anybody wants to. Again, I'm sorry, you know, Brent would have been glad. He probably would have had change and things like that. I don't have that capability. All I can say is they're $40 a piece. I'll be glad to sign them. And then, like I said, the money goes to Brent. It doesn't go to me, it goes to Brent. It's his book. All right? Thank you. Appreciate it. Stay here for just a second, Chris. Chris Payne, thank you so much. We delighted that you were able to do double duty and step in for, for Brent Coleman. Please do send him our get well wishes. Yep. Maybe we can have him back at another date. It would be a lot of fun. I, I really appreciated learning about your process. I think it's an honor to have you in our community sharing stories about our unhinged Cincinnatians. You know, you maybe, maybe Al Conscious will be in the next one. Uh, <laughs> But <laughs> hold on just a second. Just what, as a token of our appreciation, we wanted to give you a Rotary Club of Cincinnati coin. It has that four-way test on it. It's our ethical standard that which, of, by which we serve above self. And in addition, we'd like to make a donation to the End Polio Now campaign. This is the four-decade effort to eradicate that dreaded disease from the planet. There's only five cases left in the world, so we're trying to see it to its fruition. With your help, we'll get there. Let's give Chris Payne another big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just, just to let you guys know, uh, I'm a member of the local Elks Lodge up in uh, Lebanon, Ohio, so I, I champion the things you guys want because you know it's the same stuff that we do. I mean, you guys do great work in your community. It's right here in your backyard, and you're doing the best, and thank you very much. Amen to that. So one meeting today is the World Affairs Committee. They're meeting on the first floor in the tea room. Next week, it's changing of the guard, anyone? <laughs> it's in the Hall of Mirrors, and this will be our, our final meeting at the Hilton, at least for the foreseeable future. We'd like to do something special for the staff. So if you get there early, be sure to sign a card. There's going to be a thank you presentation. Look forward to seeing you all next week. Until then, meeting adjourned. <laughs>